we have about 10 minutes left. Maybe we'll open it up for for question. And and I don't call it Q and A because I don't have many answers. I call it Q and R because I can respond. But, but, but my response is not adequate, as it generally isn't very adequate. I, I hope that maybe there will be some collective wisdom that will emerge as a result of our time today. You notice when someone is in a, a cartoon or a comic book and they're speaking, they have this bubble that comes up, but it has a little pointy thing on it, but a thought bubble has little thought, little bubbles going above their heads. And uh, as I look around here today, I'm seeing a whole lot of thought bubbles. <laughs> and uh, each one of the thought bubbles is filled with the words uh, well, many of them. What the heck is that white guy doing up here? <laughs> and I'm afraid I don't have a very good, uh, adequate response to that. But uh, uh, whenever one speaks, and I know that everyone here, you have some time and opportunity to be able to speak in public. And the th content is important, but also the music. The words are important, but the music behind the words is almost as important, if not more important in some cases. I hope today that when we're done, that you can leave here today and you can say, I heard the words, but I also heard some music, and I heard the passion, I heard the sincerity of heart coming from Freeman, and uh, I hope that uh, today we have a real good time regarding that. I grew up as a, uh, a little kid in Alberta, Canada, in a little town called Three Hills. We had a count of nine ice hockey rinks in a town of 2,000 people. So, uh, you know, where I come from, sissies play basketball and wear figure skates. And I've never worn figure skates, and I'm terrible at basketball. But uh, just meet me on the rink sometime. We had, had a, and um, what, what happened is a uh, little town of 2,000 people, the, the uh, racist or bigotry, big, bigoted attitudes was more toward Native American Indians. And it was the caricature of the, the Indian, the drunken Indian down at the reservation. My parents never exported that kind of talk or that attitude, uh, but that was a, a general kind of a, a it was just a, a feel, an attitude that was present. At the age of 17, I left home. Uh, I stuck my thumb out and uh, became ultimately over a period of time, about close to two years, I hitchhiked all around North America. I became a long-haired hippie, a dope-smoking fool, and uh, uh, just my whole life was just uh, you know spending nights beside the road sometimes, and just uh, kind of making it as I could, panhandling, working at farms and, and in bakeries and different places just to make it through. Uh, I had a uh, an experience in 1972. My whole life just turned around, and I signed up for school, and ultimately uh, what happened is I. I became chaplain for the uh, Washington Bullets basketball team in the NBA. Did this for 19 years, from 1979 to uh, to 1998. Uh, but uh, uh, this is the shack shoe right here, and I happened to bring it with me. It's, uh, it's size 22, and it uh, it's, uh, it weighs about two pounds. So next time you slap on your uh, ankle weights and do your exercises, just above the uh, uh, the eating room. And I hear some of you with the medicine ball slamming them down. No, I didn't hear that. Today. But uh, uh, this is. Do you want to sniff it? <laughs> uh, just, just checking. Uh, we can arrange it later if you like. But uh, this is uh, it weighs two pounds, uh, size 22, 16 inches. And just imagine the next time you uh, look at some of the guys uh, going up and down the court. You know, he did this for so many years. Just retired this past year. But uh, why do I bring this? Well, first of all, most people have never seen a shoe this big, and uh, have a, it gives you kind of a, a hands-on kind of a sense of how large some of these guys are in the NBA. But secondly, the second reason is, uh, what is life like in shoes like this? Not necessarily Shaq, but so many other players. Well, you make more in probably in one evening than 80% uh, of the world makes an entire lifetime. Uh, you get op many opportunities coming your way, uh, shoe contracts and uh, great seats in restaurants and all kinds of different things that come your way. But there's also a downside. Uh, many times what happens is people come at you looking for something from you, and they don't even know what they're looking for. But th there's just this sense, this feel. Uh, when you get out of a limousine and there's a whole crowd of people and, and you're just walking into a club or walking into a, a movie theater or someplace like that, and just 
it, it's weird. It's, it's a whole other type of feel that, that expectations that are on, on you. Now we flip the channel. What's life like in your shoes? My shoes. What's it like being you? What, what's the upside of being you? What's the downside of being you or me? When you walk into a room into a crisis, in a crisis situation, uh, what are some of the expectations that people have of you? The unspoken expectations. Uh, maybe in a crowd this size, there have been individuals in the last decade that have been in a fetal position, crying to the no tears left because of some relational issue or some financial issue, uh, some, some family system issues going on in, in the family. And today, I just want us to take a, a look at life in our shoes. And uh, whatever <coughs> ethnicity you are or I am, uh, gender, age, w whatever we bring to the party, or whatever we, whoever we are, uh, we're going to take a look at life in our shoes.